Good morning. I appreciate the invitation to uh, be with you and to speak on, uh, on prostate brachytherapy as it uh, pertains to, to this uh, population of patients that we're discussing this weekend. Um, the picture that I'm showing here is a, it's a picture of the, uh, the Cancer Therapy Research Center. Those who are local recognize it. Uh, much of it is a new structure we moved into in January, actually. And pertinent to the last conversation, the uh, modalities of 3D conformal radiation and IMRT radiation uh, we readily offer at this facility. So for those of you who are local and seeing patients here, we've been doing IMRT for about three years and uh, have acquired significant experience with it. So uh, th these services that Dr. Roach was uh, describing to you are, uh, are services that are available here locally. My practice at the CTRC is somewhat unique in that I specialize in brachytherapy and uh, in particular prostate brachytherapy is most of my practice and so I'm pleased to talk about that particular topic uh, with you today. Uh, for those who are not as familiar with it, uh, Dr. Roach mentioned it in brief, uh, the word brachytherapy or, uh, we use for uh, late term implantation, brachytherapy is actually a, a derivative of a Greek word that means near or short and the, the meaning there is that the doses being delivered by, by brachytherapy sources are very high but they, the doses taper off very, very quickly so within short distances within millimeters the doses go from very high 100% or more to, uh, to nearly 0% within the course of uh, several millimeters. We will be talking, uh, as I give this presentation over the next several minutes, about permanent brachytherapy. Now there is another form of brachytherapy called high dose rate that uh, many of you have heard of and it is offered uh, several parts in the country but it is not uh, being done near the, uh, uh, with near the popularity of the number of cases quite yet. There isn't near the experience with it as of yet and it isn't offered in this community as of yet, but it will be. This is a program that we're starting here. I, di I did it early in uh, my career, and uh, we are going to be offering it again here in San Antonio before too long. Um, but for the most part, for this discussion of purposes of today, we're talking about the permanent form of brachytherapy, where the seeds are placed into the prostate and are left there. Uh, these, so we call them seeds, they're actually very tiny radioactive sources, about four and a half millimeters in length. They look like uh, pieces of pencil lead, is usually what patients tell me as I show them to them in advance. It's an outpatient procedure, and of course that appeals to a lot of patients. They can come in in the morning. We do them mostly under general anesthetic. Do the procedure, it takes about 30 minutes, and the patients are discharged within a few hours uh, and, and are on their way home. It is ultrasound directed, so we use an ultrasound probe in the rectum so that we can see the prostate, we can see the needles, we can see the seeds as they are dropped in the prostate. We use a transperineal approach. A lot of times patients are confused or concerned about this. They think we're gonna be entering the rectum with the needle, similar to uh, how biopsies are performed. Actually, this is, we do this through the perineum, through the skin of the perineum with a template, and I'll show you some pictures that will better describe that. I think the, at the outset here, it's the take-home messages, I think they're important for patients and, and physicians alike, is to understand some things. I'll show some data to support some of this. Is that It appears that uh, no, none of us can, can claim to be clear winners with regard to survival rates. Uh, we've seen some data that Mac showed uh, with regard to, to uh, external beam radiation therapy and, and surgery and um, certainly this applies with, ex, with the, the uh, permanent seed implants and I'll show you some of that data as well. So it appears that uh, there certainly it's not been a randomized trial. I'm not sure that there ever really will be one that will be successfully uh, accomplished. We're trying to do one as was mentioned by the last two speakers. The SPIRIT trial which randomizes between surgery and, and interstitial implant but uh, that as you might, un might expect is going to uh, have some trouble accruing patients is, my, is a lot of our concerns. Long-term complications. Uh, although we, we thought at one time, not, not too many years ago, that, that uh, interstitial brachytherapy really was a clear winner, that we had much less incontinence and impotence rates compared to other modalities. I'm not so sure as we follow the data out that the difference is uh, quite so large, but I think there is some differences depending, of course, on the quality of the implants and the technique but I think that quality of life in terms of expectation for incontinence and impotence uh, are, are favor the interstitial implant approach. This, the side effects are, uh, for the most part, are limited and transient. They're, for the most part, uh, related to the bladder. Bladder sits right on top of the prostate and it takes a, a good dose of radiation near the bladder neck and so we tell our patients going in to expect that they will have a fair amount of irritation and that they will uh, be taking medication, the alpha blockers generally, that will help their symptoms in the short term, but to understand going into this that they, they should expect that they're going to have some, some bladder dysfunction for a period of uh, a few to several months after. 
<clears throat> but the good news about those is that they are, um, they are reversible and they are temporary for the most part. And then again, the ease of treatment is what really appeals uh, for a lot of patients, uh, depending on the social situation and so forth, is, is outpatient, a one-day procedure, and the recovery is relatively rapid. We have a lot of people that are employed full-time that will come in and get their therapy done on a Wednesday or Thursday, take off the rest of the week, and are back to their normal routine by the following Monday without any difficulty. Now, one of the reasons why I think that it's important for us uh, as healthcare providers, uh, as we see patients uh, in this age group that are being diagnosed with prostate cancer, is that this is a modality that for, for many of the reasons I've described and for many others, uh, that is really growing in, uh, in number of cases performed uh, per year, growing in popularity. This is largely patient driven. Patients are uh, you know, through the media. Uh, some of you may have heard, you see it in TV reports and, and magazines, news magazines and so forth, uh, reports of people who are doing research and electing to have brachytherapy uh, the, the trend in the treatment of cancer has for many years been toward more organ preservation, whether it's breast treatment, breast cancer, larynx cancer, uh, being able to treat a, an organ without having to do radical surgery and have the comparable outcome has really been a goal for some time and, and uh, it's, at least for prostate brachytherapy appears to uh, accomplish uh, that goal. And you can see here from this graph that it is, it is clearly growing in popularity from 1994 when there were about 500 or so cases performed up until the most recent 2001 where some 55,000 procedures were performed. And this is uh, catching up very, rad very rapidly to radical prostatectomies where I think that the current numbers are somewhere around 80,000 cases per year. So this is not insignificant number of, of men diagnosed with prostate cancer in the United States are being treated with, uh, with this modality. And if this current trend continues uh, to increase, uh, is projected within a few years this could be become uh, equal if not past the number of cases performed that are uh, patients who undergo radical prostatectomy in this country. Let me just make some comments about patient selection. I think it's very important. We've commented a lot about on the, that this morning. The patients who are good candidates for monotherapy, meaning just a seed implant, no other uh, adjuvant therapy, no hormone therapy, no external beam radiation therapy, are much the same as the, same, the patients who you'd expect to do well with any therapy, whether they had radical surgery or external beam radiation. The Dr. Culkin and Dr. Roach's patients would do very well with either, either modality. Uh, and what I always emphasize to patients, uh, it's not just what you choose, but it's, it's who's going to offer it to you, who's going to perform it. You want to make sure that, you, that your team that's going to be involved in providing the services to you uh, is, is good at what they do. Early stage patients, obviously, T1A to T, some selected T1Bs, Gleason sums of six or less, patients with PSAs under 10. Those are the stage grade and PSA are the primary things that we look at, but there's many other factors, including the number of biopsies that are involved <coughs> that we look at. Now, does that mean that no one else can be a candidate for a seed implant? Uh, it, it doesn't. There are still so many patients who are candidates for a seed implant, perhaps as a boost in combination with external beam radiation so that we have the benefit of both modalities, treatment of a high dose from the inside out with the brachytherapy and from the outside in with the external beam radiation therapy. Most often not so much to address risk of lymph nodes. As we know, we've talked about that's become uh, less and less common, but it's to address uh, disease perhaps in the capsule or beyond the capsule in, in the general uh, proximity of the prostate itself. <coughs> so these would be patients with more advanced tumors, more, uh, more bulk uh, on palpation, Gleason sums of seven or higher, people with uh, PSAs above 10, multiple bilateral positive biopsies. Uh, we, we think as we get more information for all these patients is, is probably more important than we've ever realized. Things like perineural invasion, which is somewhat subjective and varies between pathology departments, but things like that may help to tip us uh, to make decisions about whether or not to be more aggressive in adding uh, combined radiation therapies. Now let me just show you some, some of the most recent uh, data. This, uh, to my knowledge, has not been published yet. This is out of Seattle where this procedure was really pioneered in this country. And they have now 14-year uh, data that's come out that they presented their advanced uh, prostate brachytherapy symposium that they do every spring. And they have 14-year data. Now you can see at the bottom of the graph that the number of patients at risk is, is quite small. But I think the importance of the graph is you can see that the, the curves tend to, are tending to reach a plateau 
In other words, there aren't a lot of, of late failures that are occurring as many critics thought, thought that would uh, predict it would happen. If you take low-risk patients, the ones that I described that were good monotherapy candidates for any single therapy, 87% of them are, are alive and well and free of any evidence about chemically of disease. In the, prostate, in the Seattle prostate implant series, that, that's defined as a PSA of 0 0.5. Intermediate risk are patients with Gleason 7 or a PSA of 10 to 12, but not both. If they have one of those factors, it drops off some down to 74%. And then if they have both, both adverse factors of a high PSA and a high Gleason sum, then uh, you can see that they drop to, to less than half of the patients are alive and free of disease biochemically. <clears throat> now, how do these numbers compare to other modern series? Uh, Dr. Roach showed some of this uh, data, different series, but uh, you can look across the, across the board. You can look at radical surgery performed at the University of Pennsylvania. You can look at 3D uh, conformal dose, uh, high dose radiation therapy delivered at Harvard. Uh, you can look at uh, interstitial implantation at, um, in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering, or you can look at the seed implants at Seattle. And you can see uh, stratifying by risk, low, intermediate, and high. Certainly, as you predict for all, just about all series, uh, the higher the risk, the, the, as you would expect, the, the decreasing chance of PSA control. But important, I think, is to notice that the, that the data being uh, published shows that even for the high-grade uh, patients, you can see relative to, certainly relative to uh, high dose 3D conformal radiation or to radical surgery, patients getting seeds uh, are, are comparing quite well. Now there's very few patients in this series uh, with seeds alone. Most of them, as I said, are being treated with external beam. But more important than that, since we don't see nearly as many of these patients, are these guys up here in the low risk and the intermediate risk uh, groups. You can see nine, in the 90, 80 to 90 percent control rate uh, by PSA. Now I think it's, um, it's, it's important for us to, to look at all the, uh, the alternative options for treatment uh, quite honestly. And uh, I think Dr. Culkin uh, showed this data actually from Zinke, but he showed it out to 10 years and, and didn't show the, the uh, data beyond that. There is only, because PSA is a relatively new test if you think about it, PSA based results uh, really are only available for about the last 15 or so years. It was a, I think in the mid to late 80s when I was a resident with uh, Dr. Roach at Stanford that we were uh, starting to get PSAs and we had no idea what they meant. We'd get, we'd get a PSA in the triple digits and we thought, well, well, we'll make note of that and we'll go ahead and treat them. We didn't know what it meant at that time. My point is that to have PSA based data, uh, no one can claim to have very long extended survival data based on PSA uh, much beyond that. There are two series that are available that are, that are uh, in the literature. One is this group from Zinke, uh, published by Zinke at the Mayo Clinic, and it is not all that impressive. So when I see patients that tell me their surgeons tell them that they should have radical surgery because it's a gold standard and it's been around the longest and has the best results, uh, I, I tell them that perhaps they ought to uh, look past that and, and say, you know, where is that data? Show, show me what you mean because there really isn't all that much. Here is uh, one of the two studies in literature out to 15 years, P here's a PSA control curve down here at the bottom, uh, and that is 40 percent. 40 percent of those men 15 years after surgery are alive without evidence of prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> now that, um, there are some patients that uh, obviously their overall survival has to be taken into account, people dying from competing causes and so forth, but uh, clearly 40% uh, is not something that we should be telling our patients is, is the gold standard that nothing is, uh, can be offered that's comparable. This is the same data being shown in a table. Uh, if you look at patients with Gleason 7 down at the bottom, just simple factor of Gleason 7 disease, 26% of these men had PSA controls um, defined as 0.2 at 15 years. The quality, quality of life is becoming more of an issue and I think is where we're really turning our focus in the area of prostate brachytherapy in the last year or two. I think that many of us believe that we've got uh, very good results that are comparable to other forms of therapy uh, and that now perhaps we should be emphasizing, um, you know, we can't, can't improve a lot on 90 percent or so PSA control in favorable patients, but we can perhaps look at ways to improve quality of life and so that's when I do a consultation now with patients. That's where we spend a lot of our time talking about, you know, what's important to them, what are their concerns. And if we look at, uh, you can look across the board, a brachytherapy, radical surgery, and external beam radiation therapy, and the LUTS is lower urinary tract symptoms. And you can compare that versus stricture versus incontinence versus proctitis and impotence. 
this is SEER data, and you know the numbers are all over the board, but SEER uh, data we generally think is being fairly uh, non-biased and, and fairly general uh, across the country. You can see the numbers that are reported there that uh, brachytherapy fares very well, certainly with incontinence, um, and I think is maybe the number one reason that men now, are, uh, in my experience, are selecting brachytherapy because they don't want to take that risk of, of uh, problems with bladder control. Um, and then maybe second to that or third to that would be potency uh, preservation. Uh, certainly patients that get seed implants have a significant amount of lower urinary tract symptoms, but as I said earlier, they tend to be transient and most, uh, most all of it uh, resolves within the course of a few months. Now I thought it might be interesting for those of you uh, who have never uh, seen a procedure just to kind of walk you through uh, the preparation for it and how we do a, a seed implant of the prostate. It starts with the ultrasound volume study. An ultrasound probe is inserted into the rectum. Patient is not anesthetized. They lay on their back, put them in a dorsal lithotomy position, and uh, you know many of them tell us that then now they have sympathy for what the women go through uh, with their exams and childbirth and so forth. A very uh, non-dignified position uh, for a man, um, they tell me. Um, we. During the ultrasound, we uh, detect uh, the size and the shape of the prostate, both. Uh, that allows us to be able to, to figure out how many needles and how many seeds, uh, and more importantly, where, where each seed should go into the prostate. It's performed in the clinic. We do these, I do mine at the Cancer Therapy Research Center uh, with the same ultrasound unit that I used to do the implant with on the same table, the same birth position, same dorsal lithotomy position. No anesthesia, and, and a lot of them, the other thing I think I appreciate more as I do ultrasounds is that the, in general men have a, a lower tolerance for discomfort and pain than women. Um, they, uh, they really don't like the ultrasound very much at all. There's no needles involved, no biopsies, but the probe is pretty good caliber and, uh, and most of them accuse me of using a baseball bat with the exam. But it's, uh, it's very short, it's five, usually five minutes or so, so I tell them if they can, if they can uh, just bear it for five minutes, we can get good accurate pictures and, and most of them will survive it. And this is a result of that volume study. You can see that uh, every five millimeters we take an axial image here, going from left to right, from top to bottom, and you can see the red numbers here indicate where in the prostate it is. We reference from the base or the top of the gland where the uh, nearest, the, nearest the bladder, so this would be the base, this would be the plus 5 millimeters, 10, 15, 20, and so forth down to the apex. This particular man's prostate is 35 millimeters in length, and each uh, transverse image we can contour the prostate, and based on that, the computer reconstructs these images in three dimensions and gives us an exact volume, and the physics team will determine exactly where to put each needle and seed so that we stay away from important structures like the rectum here posteriorly, like the bladder, which is the next cut up above here, um, the neurovascular bundles, which are on the sides of the, of the prostate, and uh, allow us to do a good quality implant to cover with very high doses in the prostate itself, but with doses that rapidly taper off over the course of several millimeters beyond it. Based on that ultrasound, uh, we have uh, implant design. We have a physics staff that designs exactly where the needles and seeds go. Um, they will generate isodose volumes, as I'm displaying here, these colored lines that you see here, much like Dr. Roach showed with his external beam. These show you uh, volumes, or at least in two dimensions, isodose uh, lines. If you stack them on, on one another, they become volumes uh, of doses that cover uh, the volumes within, within that uh, particular contour. We can evaluate the coverage. We know that we want a, a prescribed dose to cover the entire prostate. We know that we don't want high dose regions, uh, which, which can become very high. We don't want them near the critical structures, such as the, the bladder and the, and the urethra and the rectum. We order the sources or the seeds. They're shipped to us. Uh, the needles in which they are loaded are sterilized, and then the seeds are loaded into them, and then the needles are placed in, in turn. <coughs> the man is positioned here. Uh, with uh, the drape over the top, his legs are up in the dorsal lithotomy position out of the picture. And then you can see here that uh, we're kind of looking down the, the barrel of the rifle, if you will. Here's the ultrasound probe in the rectum, and a template is placed right over the top of it. And it's got uh, letters um, across the bottom of it and numbers on the side. And tells us exactly, we know exactly based on our plan from the physics plan, exactly which holes we're going to use in a particular patient, depending on their size and shape. The image that is generated, as we see here on a couple of monitors in the operating room, we can see each needle and seed as it's placed into the prostate. 
the anesthesia we, we most often use is general anesthetic. Um, I'll kind of walk through some of these steps. The patient is, is positioned and prepped. The ultrasound uh, probe is aligned just like it was in the ultrasound volume study in advance, usually a week or two before. The gland is anchored using stabilization needles. The needles are placed under axial imaging, and then the seeds are placed under longitudinal imaging, and then a fluoroscopy is done to confirm the position of everything and then what case is done. This whole thing, as I described it here, takes around 30 uh, minutes. Uh, total time in the operating room, about 50 to 60 minutes, with the procedure taking about half that time. Now, the, the technique that we use is, is one variation. Uh, people all across the country have different techniques and different equipment and so forth, so it, this is um, uh, something that's uh, not the only way to do the procedure, but this is the way that we, we have uh, developed over the course of, of about 13 years of doing seed implants. We favor the general anesthetic because it's quick, the patients recover quickly, and there isn't, um, there isn't much in the way of uh, no patient motion as opposed to some patients who do require spinal for different reasons, personal preference or cardiopulmonary risk or whatever the anesthesiologist might uh, be a prefer. Um, so general is probably 95% of the patients are, have general anesthetic. There, uh, there is that dorsal lithotomy position and the uh, probe uh, lined up in position. This is a betadine on the drape. That's not, uh, we don't make that big a mess with blood. He's positioned just like in the volume study. The hips are flexed. Uh, we make sure they're straight on the table. The catheter is placed into the bladder after they're asleep so we can see the bladder very clearly in the urethra. The scrotum is retracted generally with some sticky adhesive uh, upside or some form of tape that holds uh, the scrotum out of the way. There's a prep uh, and then the case is initiated. The tools of the trade, the way that we do implants is with preloaded needles, uh, some of which are shown here on the left. This is a lead box or called a pig. Uh, that has, if you, if you can see it, uh, has numbers on the side and letters on the bottom that corresponds to the template that we use so that we know exactly when we take out a particular needle out of a particular hole in the box, which hole it goes into the template one at a time. <coughs> it is then uh, anchored, and um, I think this is difficult to see, but what my finger is pointing out here is a, is a barb that comes out of these particular special needles that allow us to place a needle in position um, uh, deploy a barb that holds the, the prostate in place, put a little bit of traction on the gland and hold and it keeps it, helps to hold it still because there is a fair amount of motion in the prostate. It's something I really appreciate uh, as I've been doing prostate brachytherapy, how much motion there is. Dr. Uh, Roach uh, mentioned that was one of the limitations of external beam radiation is you have to account for the fact that the, there is motion in the prostate, whether you're pushing it with a needle or the bladder fills or the rectum fills or empties. <clears throat> and you can see here, if you look closely, these two little white uh, uh, signals here are where the two anchors are in the lateral aspects of the prostate to hold it in position. The other technique besides stabilizing needles that we use is um, simply using uh, multiple needles. We put in several needles at a time and that helps to stabilize the prostate and keep it from torquing or moving away from us and then actually the Foley balloon, we put gentle, tra gentle traction on that Foley balloon to hold the prostate uh, in place as well. You have to always uh, rebase, we call it, and that is uh, throughout the case, keep checking what your reference point is because all, all of the needles and all the seeds are placed in according to where the zero plane or that base was at the beginning of the case, and it can move. And uh, so we always go back to it throughout the case, make sure if it's shifted that we shift with it and so forth. And you always look at your longitudinal image. I'll show you some pictures of that. Check the Foley position. Make sure the urethra is where you think it is so you are careful about where you place your needles and seeds at that point. Now the axial image, oops, uh, actually this is, this is what it looks like in the operating room. I, I think maybe there's too much light to, to see this very well, but uh, we put a, a series of several needles in at a time, and uh, this, is, uh, this is actually my hand holding some of the needles out of the way while the urologist inserts the needles. So I'm trying to keep the other ones out of the way so that we don't uh, prematurely deploy any seeds before we're ready. We're just looking at axial image at this point. So we'll put an array of, C of needles in at this point, which as I said, helps to stabilize the gland. <clears throat> and then we, this is what we're looking at, is we're putting these needles in. We're looking at an ultrasound screen, a couple of television monitors, one on each side of the patient. And you can see these little white signals indicate the needles that are in the prostate gland, the peripheral zone of the prostate. And then in the operating room, um, as we're getting ready, as the needles are in place, uh, we will simply swing this, uh, the ultrasound probe will swing left and right so we can get in different longitudinal planes and see each needle. 
And the imaging that we're getting now with ultrasound has really have been uh, one of the things that's really been amazing to me, having done this procedure now for, for uh, some time, is uh, we thought that we could see so clearly 10 years ago, it was nothing compared to what we can see now. We can see in two planes to the point now that we can actually see the seed as it comes out of the needle. So here's an image of a, and this never does it justice because this is a, a picture of a picture and it's uh, not dynamic, uh, but uh, this is uh, what we're looking at longitudinally. I'll just to orient you, this is a, we're looking from the side. This is a balloon in the, in the bladder, the uh, fully catheter balloon. This is a needle coming in posteriorly. Back down here is the, uh, is the rectum. This is the rectal wall here and rectum down here. So this is a posterior needle coming in, and this is what we would call the base or zero plane where the red line is indicated. Again, another picture of the posterior needle coming in. Once the needle is in place and we're happy with the position of the tip, then the seeds will be deployed and the needle's withdrawn. Here's an anterior needle up toward, more toward the front of the prostate. And you have to be careful. This balloon is, uh, uh, you can pop it, we found out. Um, the, this, as this needle is advanced, if you go a little bit too far, you, uh, that you uh, can easily pop that balloon, which isn't terrible, but it does d diminish your image a little bit. So you have to watch that as well as, as wanting, the, obviously you want to get good dose to the base as well as the rest of the prostate. So you want to put your seeds as high as you can without putting them into the, popping the balloon or putting them into the, into the bladder. And then at the end, uh, uh, in our technique at least, we don't use a lot of fluoroscopy. We'll take a fluoroscopic image just to see the uh, position of the, of the seeds, make sure that they, none of them appear to be high up in the bladder, for example, or drugged down. Um, we usually have a few extra seeds at the end of the case. If we deem in a particular area that looks like it, it may be cold, we will put a couple of extra seeds in that position and, uh, if, uh, if deemed necessary. And that's the uh, end of the case. The patient is discharged to recovery. After they wake up, we withdraw the catheter, make sure they can urinate, and um, patients will go home, about 95% of them, without a catheter uh, later that same day. So I hope that gives you a better idea what prostate brachytherapy is and uh, which patients might be candidates for it. And it, uh, if there's time later, I'd be happy to answer uh, more questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come up before you and, and chat a little bit about this subject. I think that the evidence that I'll present today presents a powerful case that there is a group of individuals who are candidates for watchful waiting. And we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, how this evidence uh, has been presented and, and some fairly new and exciting evidence that I'll get to shortly. But we, we know that uh, from studies that have been done that some 80% of men over the age of at 80, who reach the age of 80, who uh, undergo an autopsy, will have some histological evidence of prostate cancer, and a lot of people have been have used this statistic to sort of be critics of screening to say, hey, we're going to find these cancers that never killed anybody, never caused them any harm. It turns out that you know from Catalona's work and others that that this is a very small volume of cancer, the so-called latent cancer, and that we are not able to detect it. PSA is not that good to, to, to define it. But nevertheless, it does highlight the fact that a lot of these older men that we're seeing, that we're talking about here today, um, will, if you look hard enough, find disease. I'm going to uh, show some evidence today that there's a very long natural history uh, of untreated good risk prostate cancer, the sort of thing that uh, Dr. Prestige mentioned uh, shortly. Uh, patients who have low stage, low grade, low PSA disease, and that these individuals we may consider for watchful waiting over other therapies. And in large part, that stems from the fact that everybody has pr previously mentioned that the curative therapies that we have for prostate cancer impact patients' quality of life significantly. And I'm not going to go through all those in detail, but we're going to talk some about the quality of life data because I think it's very important. There is no free ride in this disease. When we talk about what constitutes an elderly uh, man, I think it's important to look back at uh, life expectancy in the United States. At the turn of the century, a man had the probability of living to be about 45 years of age was the average median life expectancy. And that's dramatically risen 
to, to now, uh, and the average man lives to be about 75, which is a significant uh, improvement. Furthermore, when you look at individuals who attain the age of 65, that some six, they have a 16 year life expectancy. Even men who attain the age of 75 have a 10 year life expectancy. So people are living longer and they're going to increasingly be uh, in our offices potentially diagnosed with prostate cancer and we're going to have to take a look at that. At the same time, this aged group of individuals that you're well acquainted with have a lot of issues. Cer certainly comorbidities are big problems and we have to look at their individual issues. We have to individualize these patients because certainly not everyone's chronological age is their physiological age as we can cite numerous examples, I'm sure each of us. When you look at leading cause of death for men over the age of 65, certainly heart disease is the number one. Um, but when you accumulate other issues like pulmonary disease, cardiovascular, uh, or cerebrovascular accidents and diabetes, that's a significant number of individuals dying of diseases other than cancer. And certainly this cancer includes a lot of things other than prostate cancer. So the, the, most of older men are going to die of something other than the disease. And certainly that's important when you take a look at the natural history of prostate cancer. Uh, we don't know exactly what the natural history of prostate cancer is, but there's a lot of evidence that I want to present today that gives us some insight. Um, Johansson, uh, really his study that was uh, published in 92 and then a follow-up in 97 was sort of the, uh, a very important study that sparked a lot of debate in, in among folks who care for patients with prostate cancer about what do you do with these people. They seem to have a long history if they go untreated. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of these other studies. I want to highlight Holmberg's recent study from the September 12th issue of New England Journal in which they're reporting a study in which patients are randomized to either watchful waiting or radical prostatectomy and I think that's very, very important data and we'll get to that momentarily. In Johansson's study, uh, he looked at a very large number. This is the follow-up in 97 of 642 men uh, who received no initial curative therapy with 15-year follow-up. Uh, it's important to note that the majority of these individuals were over the age of 70. In fact, the median age was 72. 85 men only in that whole group were under the age of 70. So you're talking about a group that we're interested in here, the older man. The majority of these men had well to moderately differentiated disease. And when you look at their outcome, the individuals with, with mel well differentiated disease, only 6% of them died uh, of that disease in that follow-up period, the majority dying of, of uh, uh, comorbid illness. But when you look at more poorly differentiated disease, the Gleason 8, 9, and 10 type of uh, disease that we've mentioned earlier, the majority of those individuals were actually dying of prostate cancer. And this study serves to highlight what some of these other studies um, uh, also say that you can predict to a degree the individuals who are most likely to die of the disease and those who won't, which is an important issue when you talk of watchful waiting. Chodak in a larger group in 94 uh, published similar uh, data. Now his, a lot of his patients did receive hormonal therapy when they progressed, but again these were individuals who chose initially watchful waiting alone. And in the individuals with well to moderately differentiated disease, they had an 87 percent 10 year disease, disease specific survival. In contradistinction, the individuals with poorly differentiated disease had a much more uh, poor outcome with only a 34 percent 10 year disease specific survival. Again highlighting that we may be able to predict who's likely to do poorly and who's likely to do well without treatment initially. As I mentioned earlier, we're talking about an, a group of individuals who have a lot of competing comorbid illnesses that are more likely to cause them to die of their disease. And Peter Albertson's study has gotten a lot of uh, fare here today and appropriately so because he, he studied this from the Connecticut Tumor Registry and with 10 to 20 year follow-up of a very large number of individuals, he found that, that the majority of these individuals across the board died of their competing illnesses and not prostate cancer. Only 23 percent di died of prostate cancer and very few with Gleason uh, score less than six tumors. Now when you further break down his data, I think it's instructive. When you look at the age issues, now this, this uh, little diagram I have, these are all patients who have Gleason score six or below. And patients that have, if you look at the older group here in this far column, um, you, you can see that, that the majority of these individuals, almost 62 percent, died of their comorbid illness, while only uh, about 19 percent died of prostate cancer. As compared to less than 65, uh, only a third of those individuals actually died of 
the, of comor comorbid illness. So certainly as men are getting older, they're more likely to die of their disease in that particular group. When you look at Gleason 7, you see a, a transition here where it's sort of a, a gray area, more poorly differentiated than, than the other group. In the 70 to 74 group, uh, 70 to 74 year old group, 40 percent of those patients are dying of their disease, almost an equal split compared to the comorbid illness. And again, you're seeing that, that in that younger group, very few of these individuals are dying of other illnesses. They're actually, the majority are dying from prostate cancer. And this is even more so when you take a look at the Gleason 8, 9, and 10. Again, in this older group, uh, less than a quarter of them are dying of comorbid illnesses, and, and almost 70 percent of them are dying of, of prostate cancer. So I think that his data suggests that, again, a little bit more precisely now that you can determine individuals who are at more risk of dying of the disease versus those who are likely to die of competing illness. And I think that helps in terms of selecting patients for watchful waiting or who may be a good candidate for watchful waiting. In the CAPTURE database, which is a very nice geographically diverse database, um, there was a recent report in 2000 looking at 329 patients out of the database who initially chose watchful waiting. Now, majority of these individuals, again, as in the other series I've presented, are fairly old, the majority of them over the age of 75, with a fairly short follow-up of only two and a quarter years. Uh, but, but highlight this number, in that in interim period, only a, a small percentage of these individuals actually died of prostate cancer. Um, but what was more, I th think, insightful in this particular study as opposed to natural history is what happens psychologically to men who initially choose watchful waiting. And interestingly, they do pretty well. About 40 percent of them, though, did during that, that, this interval period choose to switch from watchful waiting to some other delayed therapy. And the majority of these were hormonal therapy uh, and, and only a smaller percentage getting external beam radiation therapy. That, that what I just presented there was all comers, but the article did further break that down. Now, I want to move on to this study because this is the study I mentioned, the very recent report from Holmberg in Sweden. This is the group that was randomized to watchful waiting versus radical prostatectomy. 698 pa patients, and in the intention to treat analysis, some 318 were, were randomized and ultimately did go with watchful waiting, 293 radical prostatectomy. And the mean, median follow-up here was 6.2 years. Um, interestingly, they chose a PSA of less than 50 as, as the uh, inclusion uh, criteria for the study, which, again, may be debatable about whether that's such a good point, but I, I highlight it now. When you break down the, these two groups, watchful waiting on your left and radical prostatectomy on the right, in all of the criteria in terms of tumor characteristics and age and everything else, you see very clearly that these are very well matched groups. Median age is precisely the same at just about 65. Uh, median PSA, again, very similar around 12. And when you look at, at the PSA breakdown, they're almost identical. Same thing with clinical stage and Gleason score. So a very comparable group of individuals. Now when you look at their outcome in terms of disease specific mortality, there was a statistically significant benefit in favor of radical prostatectomy uh, at both the five and eight year analysis. So you can see, again, at the eight year point, 13.6 percent disease specific mortality in watchful waiting as opposed to seven percent in the radical prostatectomy group. When you look at metastasis free survival, again, similarly stati statistically significant in favor of, of radical prostatectomy. In terms of local progression, however, you see, uh, again, a very highly statistic statistical significance, again, favoring radical prostatectomy. And these were individuals who were having problems from their disease. In other words, most of them needing transurethral resection of prostate, radiation for bony mets. And, and the, an important point to highlight here is that, it, again, watchful waiting is not a free ride either, that these individuals are at risk to have things that impair their quality of life in terms of watchful waiting and uh, that they may need to have adjunctive therapies uh, during that period of follow-up, even if they don't perhaps die of the disease. However, when you looked in this series at overall mortality, both at five and eight years, there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups. Now, while you'd initially look at this data and say, hey, this is pretty compelling that radical prostatectomy in a group that's very well matched, randomized, the kind of study we've been dying for, 
Um, you also have to kind of take a look at it a little bit more carefully that when you look at the disease specific mortality, the reduction was only 6% over the watchful waiting group. And in fact, to, to highlight that point, you'd have to have 17 patients treated with radical prostatectomy to, to prevent one prostate cancer death over the, over the eight year evaluation period. And, uh, and, and also, similarly, the rate of distant METs was reduced 14%. So we're talking about statistically significant uh, differences, but perhaps not dramatic differences. And, and while, why that is important is that when we look at quality of life impact, it is significant in almost everything that we talk about, whether it's Dr. Presage's brachytherapy or radical prostatectomy or external beam radiation therapy. Everything that we do to these patients with curative intent produces some impact on their quality of life. And Mark Litwin in 95 in his JAMA article really started to uh, get the discussion going in the literature about how we measure this and what the actual impact on quality of life is in a more objective way. And in that study, in, in, in this group of individuals where he actually looked at radical prostatectomy patients, radiation therapy, and watchful waiting, you can see that as in almost all these series, the external beam and watchful waiting series, the patients are older. Um, he did have an age match group because we do know that as men are aging, there is a quality of life detriment that happens by virtue of age itself and the competing illnesses that patients get. Uh, very good survey completion rate. He looked at the fact G RAN cares quality of life instruments, which are validated instruments. And when you look at his results here in, in the, in the uh, tabulation, what you'll see is the, uh, the comparison group or the age match controls the higher the number, the higher the perceived quality of life. That if you look at sexual function here in terms of surgery versus uh, radiation therapy or the observation group, that the observation group looked almost identical to the comparison group as you'd expect, but that there was highly stati high statistical significance favoring observation in, uh, the observation group when you compared these two in terms of the quality of life. A lot of impact here certainly in terms of uh, sexual function. And when you look at uh, urinary function, uh, a similar uh, issue with respect to surgery by comparison of observation. Um, bowel function in this particular uh, area, the do domains were not st uh, statistically significant between those groups. Now Stanford, looking more precisely at the impact of radical prostatectomy, demonstrated quite nicely in, in a study published again in JAMA in 2000 that older men do more poorly with radical prostatectomy. The older you are, the more likely you are to have urinary dysfunction in the form of incontinence and more likely to, to have that persist over time. And as you can see in the men less than 60, and I want to draw your attention here to the uh, occasion, I mean frequent versus no control. So free, the frequent leakage are patients who are reporting absolutely no urinary control that in the, the men at baseline, very few of them in the less than 60 group, very few also in the 70-75 group, but certainly more. But at 12 months following radical prostatectomy, you can see that there's a big difference between this group less than 60 and the 70 to 75 plus year old men. And that over time, that doesn't get better, as opposed to the less than 60 group where you see continued improvement in their urinary function over time. Similarly, when you look at uh, her data with respect to sexual function, she also demonstrated, again, that the, the older men at baseline are not doing as well as the younger men, as you'd expect in terms of sexual function, but that when they get uh, radical prostatectomy, certainly over time, they don't seem to get the kind of improvement that the younger group does. So their, their quality of life impairment seems to be more prolonged. Uh, Marty Sanda's group reported a, a very nice study looking at external beam radiation therapy as well as brachytherapy and radical prostatectomy where they used, again, validated uh, instruments given to the patients anonymously. And you can see, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, older men in the external beam group uh, and brachy group as compared to surgery, um, but very similar median time since their treatment across these uh, treatment spectrums. Now, this is somewhat of a busy slide. Uh, but the darker the area on the pie graph, the, more, the worse the patient's perceived quality of life. And you can see that, e that even when you take a look at, at brachytherapy here, look down here at the sexual function, you can see that, that, that these individuals have a perceived significant impact uh, a, as well as the patients with external beam and surgery. So across the board, these individuals are having difficulties. You see in terms of the uh, urinary bother, um, much less certainly in the, the brachytherapy group and uh, over radical prostatectomy, certainly a bigger group when you compare that to the control group over here. But, but bottom line is 
in all of these instances, these patients have significant issues with their quality of life as compared to the, the controls. Having said that, obviously, we need to uh, be very careful in terms of our selection. I believe that this evidence does support that there is, there are patients who are good candidates for quality of life. At the same time, this evidence supports the fact that there are patients who are terrible candidates for watchful waiting. And I believe that a good recommended patient from this evidence is an individual who's over the age of 70 or who has an, a life expectancy of less than 10 years. Certainly that would incorporate people with competing comorbid illness. I think patients need to have a Gleason sum of six or below and a PSA of less than 10. That individual, I believe, is a reasonable candidate for watchful waiting. And by way of concluding the, this evidence, I think that majority of men over the age of 70 will die of their comorbid illness or, rather than prostate cancer in the setting of low, uh, well, of good risk disease. Again, not the patient, patient with Gleason nine, 8, 9, and 10. And I think that this natural history data allows us to predict those individuals based on their tumor-specific criteria. And I think in, in, in addition, we need to individualize this data because the quality of life impact is a very significant one. Thank you for your attention. I'd like, thank, I'd like to thank Dr. Prestige and Dr. Lance for their presentations. Um, we have a few minutes before the break if, if there are any questions for either, either panelists.